welcome to Public Square, Conversations in Democracy, where we explore the heart of democracy. I'm your host, Witte van Renswijk, on a mission to reboot the public sector and invigorate local democracies worldwide. Join us as we spotlight game changers, share visions and practical innovations. Let's begin today's inspiring conversation. Hello, everyone. Today, we're traveling to the city that never sleeps. Indeed, we are find ourselves in New York City. And in this episode, we're going to look at community engagement from a slightly different perspective, not through the usual public participation lens, but through the lens of government outreach. And I'm very excited to welcome our guest of today's episode, Adrian Lever, who's the executive director of the Public Engagement Unit at the City of New York. Welcome, Adrian. Thank you so much for having me. I, I like that you talk about New York as a city that never sleeps because like you, I have an infant. So that's particularly true in our household. Uh, yeah, so not related to the city, but more to personal situation. All right. Well, um, talking about personal situation, I would like to ask you um, the opening question I always ask, which is, what is your first memory of democracy? Or what is a, a, the first moment that you realized the importance of community engagement? So I started my career in politics or rather civic engagement in, in the electoral space. When I was in my early 20s, I was living in California where I grew up and I was just fascinated and excited and passionate about the campaign, the first campaign to elect Barack Obama. I joined that campaign by getting in my car, driving from California straight to Las Vegas, Nevada and showing up at a campaign office, essentially just to beg for a job. It was still two years out from the election and the state campaign team didn't even have a budget. They had no money. They had no staff. But I was just determined to work on that campaign no matter what it took. Um, my first lesson in, in my career was persistence pays off. I sat around, mm -hmm. I volunteered, I did everything I needed to until I finally got hired. And yet they sent me, an urban kid from inner city Los Angeles, to work in rural parts of the state. I ended up spending nine months, uh, give or take, up and down the state, visiting tiny little towns, many of them completely destitute former oil towns, former gold mining towns, some of them, with political opinions and experiences that were very, very different from my own, coming from urban inner city Los Angeles. And, and yet after months of sitting in living rooms, sharing stories, meeting people who in an other world I may never have come across, I found that we had so much in common and that many of the people I was meeting wanted the same things that we all want, to live a life of dignity and respect with enough food on the table, with good health and a comfortable roof over their heads. And I saw while we wanted all of these same things, many were so disconnected from politics. They felt dehumanized by their experiences interacting with the government. They felt left to fend for themselves. And it was in these first experiences of grassroots organizing that I felt the real power of connection, conversation, what happens when you actually go and sit face to face with somebody in their living room, how you can not just change hearts and minds, but also learn from one another and, um, and listen to one another. And that's a lesson that's really stayed with me throughout my career. It's, um, it's also what led me to public service. I deeply believe that we can change the way government delivers services and programs. And if we can do that, we can also rejuvenate our democracy. Right. And how old were you, Adrian, when you when you left on this, let's call it a political road trip? Uh, probably 23. <laughs> 23. Okay. And, and, and so what fueled that initial interest of, of actually going out and, and, you know, like talking to people and, and being politically engaged? Hmm. You know, I, I think I, from a young age, I was aware and interested in the political world. My my parents were very active and interested. I had done a lot of um, organizing and advocacy advocacy work when I was a kid, even back to high school. But I think something about the first campaign to elect Barack Obama really inspired me. And you know that was the message that he gave of unity, of coming together to find commonalities. It's something that I, I really believe is the backbone of my own political philosophy now as mm -hmm. I've grown into my career. And it inspired not just me, but many of us, millions across across the United States to get engaged for the first time. All right. Thanks for sharing that uh, fantastic story. I think it's a really good segue into 
the work that you're doing today, right? It's it's uh, you could say almost a continuation of um, of your work. So let's talk about um, your work at City of New York at at uh, and and your public engagement team. But what are your main goals and your activities of your team? Yeah, it is a confusing name, especially because there is a public engagement unit in the White House, which does very very different work than what we do with the public engagement unit in the city. Um, what we do is bring services to New Yorkers through grassroots community outreach. My office was designed to bring the lessons from community organizing outreach campaigns and, and like I said before, from experiences in electoral and campaign politics into the strategies of government outreach. We reach, pro, we reach out to New Yorkers in a variety of different, different ways, but we reach out proactively to help them connect to services, everything from healthcare to resources to prevent evictions. And we break down our office into four different teams. The first is a tenant team, which reaches out to find tenants who may be facing landlord harassment, political repair issues, or even threat of eviction, which is a big problem here in New York City. We also take incoming calls from tenants on a, a live caller tenant helpline. And then our second team is a housing team, which is focused on landlords and brokers, helping to identify vacant units so that we can work in partnership with the Department of Homeless Services to help move people out of shelter and into permanent homes. The third program is focused on outreach around health insurance and other health-related programs. And lastly, our special projects team is a wide range of things. We focus on lots of different undersubscribed benefits across the city. We work in partnership with other agencies on their own outreach priorities and objectives and help them reach out to New Yorkers in creative ways. And we even support emergency response. So you could say we're kind of across the board, but we are the city's outreach arm that bring the tools and tactics from outside government space into government so we can improve the way that we deliver services. Across right, the right. So we had someone um, from the city of Antwerp a couple of episodes ago who said, like, I believe in, in community engagement. We should... Um, try to really communicate things as if we're talking to like a 10 year old. So I would like to ask you like what you just said, imagine <laughs> that I am a 10 year old, you're at a family party and your 10 year old cousin asks you, Hey, Adrian, what do you do for work? What is your one sentence to try to summarize this all? Yeah, I would say we knock on doors and we make phone calls and we send text messages to talk to people about the resources that are available to them in the city. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I want to start with the outreach part. Um, so, because that is a central piece, right? And what you do, you you really go out, you are in your team, you go out, um, meet people where they are. So can you tell us a little more about the different strategies that you're employing to reach out to the, to the public, to make them aware about all the different uh, social programs and also how you make sure that those ways of outreach, how do they differ as in how do you reach different communities? How do you make sure that your outreach strategy is, that is uh, inclusive? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I guess I'll go back to the 10-year-old the elevator pitch that you just asked for. <laughs> we knock on doors. We make phone calls. I think one of the objectives that we have in our, of, in our office is to make sure that people can actually access services. It's not enough for government to provide good programs if we can't get them into the hands of the people who need them the most. Um, and we often know that people who need them the most are also the ones who are least likely to be able to find them. Many people who are struggling don't have the time or wherewithal to navigate the bureaucracy, to learn about all of the different government programs, to submit an application. And especially in a large bureaucracy like New York, where there are programs across dozens of different agencies. Uh, we are here to make sure that we can get that information into their hands and then help them through the ap application process. And we know that outreach um, is has to be robust, right? I think what differs in the tactics and tools that we bring in is that we think it's not enough to just say, hey, we sent a mailer out about this program or we ran a robocall. If we truly want to reach the people who we want, you know, who, we, who need these services, then we have to be much more aggressive. And that often means showing up at their doorstep, which is what our team is often doing. We, um, we use targeted data so that we can make sure to reach the right people and um and you know focus on on those types of campaigns so I, I you know i can give an example right now we're working on a program called rent freeze it's a program that allows older new yorkers and new yorkers with disabilities who are income eligible to freeze the rent at their current rate and we mm -hmm. know that there are so many people in new york city who are eligible for this resource but don't even know about it so our team has been knocking on doors every week 
going using targeted data to find people who are within the age range, and we believe in the income bracket, knocking on doors, talking to them about the programs, often hearing, I had no idea this was an opportunity for me, and then helping them apply. We then take them through the application process so that we can make sure they don't get stuck because they forgot to sign a page or fill out a piece of the form. Yeah. So it's fair to say that it's it's a it's a pretty um I mean low tech way. It's really going out of the building, knocking on doors, and that is for you working best. That is most effective to reach the groups that you want to reach. It's a mix. We do both the low tech, which you can call it low tech, although there's definitely technology behind the strategy. But then there's a combination of technology that helps us send peer-to-peer text messages. That's a two-way conversation text with lots of people. We use organizing tools that help us reach people at scale, but also use the maintain the personal touch. And I think the real takeaway is for us that we have to do all of those things. The non-tech retail politics is critical. Mm-hmm, and also mm-hmm. we have to bring in the more tech-savvy pieces of how to organize at scale so that we can do all of the different things at the same time. Yeah. The reason why I'm asking is I'm thinking about, and we're going to get back to that later on, what other cities could learn from you. Um, But of course, with one important caveat or one important asterisk is that we're talking about the city of New York. Uh, You you told me last time, 80,000 employees. You obviously have the resources to, uh, you know, to go out and to to knock on doors and to, to have the staff to do this. Um, which might not be the case or to a lesser extent be the case for maybe a small town somewhere um, in the United States. So that is, that's why I'm asking, like, is it, you know, like this, because actually I said low tech, but there's no tech and probably low tech. You could say that texting is, is probably the, the low tech part. Um, but it's interesting to hear that you, that you use a mix of them. Um, so I want to talk a bit more about the, the barriers to adoption, because that's, that's, that's really interesting and fascinating. I find like the idea of, hey, we've got the programs, we have the support for you, but the problem for us in terms of like the program delivery is really that people are not aware um, of, of the program. But I do wonder actually, is awareness, is that the only barrier or are there other barriers to actually making use of those programs? And could you tell a little more about um, more generally, what are the, the challenges and the barriers that you, that you face when it comes to getting people to utilize those social programs? I think there are two key barriers. The first is absolutely information and access to that information. Um, And the second is a complicated application process. We would love in an ideal world to have our team be less relevant because somebody with a click of a button could sign up for every resource that that they are eligible for. Unfortunately, given a complexity of city, state, federal laws, given that programs sit across different agencies, it's very hard to find all of these resources and then have to submit different applications for every single one. It's also, you talked about equity of access, it's it's also particularly challenging in a multicultural and multilingual city like New York. We, we are very lucky at the public engagement unit to have an amazing, incredible, and very diverse staff. Many of our team come from the communities of the constituents that we're working to serve. We have every age, race, ethnicity, color, personality, (laughs) Um, and many of our staff are are also for immigrants as well. And in New York City, it's so important because we can reach people in their own language. We can reach people with faces that look familiar to them, stories that sound familiar to them, so that there is a level of trust that they may not otherwise have. Our staff speak over 20 languages. And then in times when we can't, we also have a really amazing tool in New York City called the Language Line that allows us to connect with a live interpreter over the phone. So if you're talking to someone in a language that we don't have readily available, say Urdu, we can get onto a language line and have a live translator work with us to help get that person connected to the application process that they need. This is where I wanted to go um, to, yeah, I want to hear from you a couple of like tactics when it comes to like grassroots um, you know, outreach, what works. So you said language access is a very important to, to come to like an equitable outreach strategy. Um, you said having people from your team, you know, who know the neighborhood, who feel part of the community, who are probably also recognize, recognized or known in the community. Could you share a couple more uh, tactics, things that work particularly well for you? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I think what makes us and our team most innovative is that we push the boundaries of what you might otherwise expect from government. 
it's not necessarily that the tactics that we use are com- innovative in the larger community. Mm-hmm. We know that some of the grassroots organizing tactics, the door-to-door canvassing, the retail politics, and the more innovative text messaging work is happening through lots of nonprofits and grassroots community organizations here in the United States and, and also globally. But we are able to combine that work in government with often data that only government agencies have access to. And I think that combination of strategies that push the needle on proactive outreach and also thoughtful data and good targeting, that's really the key for our success. Um, And I'll give you an example. We currently are working on a campaign called Fair Fares. It's a discounted transit card that we have here in New York City that offers 50% off to low-income New Yorkers on their subway rides, bus rides, et cetera. We know that there are hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers who are enrolled in food stamps or cash assistance, which means we know they're also income eligible for a fair fares card. And when you look into the database, you see they have not yet applied. They don't have that card. So we've taken that list in partnership with our agency partners. We take that, we load it into our text message tool. We then send um, text peer-to-peer text messages out to all of those people. Again, this is hundreds of thousands of people. And what makes peer-to-peer texting so interesting is that instead of sending a mass communication, you're giving a person on the who's receiving the text the opportunity to respond and connect with a real person. So when someone responds to that message, they get connected to someone from our team who then can either text back with them or pick up the phone and call. And so when they say, yes, I'd like help, I'm interested in learning more, we can follow up with those New Yorkers, have a much more narrow list of people we need to talk to and help them get enrolled. Okay. Um, so just, uh, I want to ask one more question on the, on the philosophy of the program, because it's clear, I mean, if it's a spectrum, there is one end of the spectrum, which is like, hey, the programs exist, they're out there, but you got to find out about it yourself. And, and so being very passive, which, which I guess is the case for most governments or most, most city authorities. Um, the example of the, the Metro car that you just give, what I, while you're sharing the story, I wonder like, what is the reason actually that government is not saying, Hey, you are eligible. So here's your Metro card. What is, because you are clearly in between, right? You want to kind of sensibilize, you want to create awareness, Hey, you know, apply for this Metro card, but why is there still that step of you should apply for those benefits as opposed to, Hey, here's the benefits. It's a great question. And I think it's a really complex answer. I won't, I will say very honestly, I think there's more that we can be doing. And I know New York City is working very hard to think about how we can integrate data across agencies to better determine eligibility, to make it easier to automatically subscribe in certain benefits. Uh, the This administration has been talking a lot about a tool called My City that is in its future iteration, going to be an opportunity, a place where you can go and get all of your different programs in one place, have a unified account. There are so many things that make that challenging right now. We have, first of all, this is a huge bureaucracy. Like I said, have said many times, we have lots of different agencies that each have their own data sources. Um, In addition to that, we then have some data that's federal and some programs that are federal, and you can't use that particular federal restriction for other things. Same with state and city differences. So, you know, I think the complexity and the robustness of our institutions, which are a wonderful thing because there are so many things that are available to people and from from many different financial resources from different places, it's a good thing. And it's also a real challenge because it makes bringing all those things together very, very hard and operationally difficult. And it's something that we have to keep working to improve upon. But in the meantime, until we figure that out, it's our role to go out and make sure people know about those services and can connect to them. Got it. Got it. So, okay. That, that, that makes it clear. So that's, it's not intentionally, it's not by design. Um, it's maybe where you could go to have it a bit more automated. Um, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Well, um, I want to shift gears and I want to talk a little more about measuring impact and impact. What does that mean to you and your team? So, um, yeah, that would be my my first question. What 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 is actually what does impact mean for you and your team? It really depends on the campaign we're running. So I mentioned the rent freeze program. For us, the impact is how many people we are able to reach who may not otherwise have known about that program, and how many applications we can get started for them. We don't always control the end result. Someone may not be eligible for a resource. There may be a reason that we can't get them access to it. But our job is to make sure that they know about it 
and that they don't get stuck because of a bureaucratic hurdle. So we really measure our success based on the number of people we've reached and the number of applications we've started. For another program, uh, for instance, our illegal lockouts campaign, I was just out in the community in East New York with our team yesterday. We were doing work to spread awareness around illegal lockouts. In New York, New York City tenants are protected. And what that means is they are not legally allowed to be locked out by their landlord or even pressured to leave without a formal court process. And too often, tenants don't know about their rights. So they may voluntarily leave or voluntarily under pressure leave because they don't know they have the right to stay. Or a landlord may lock them out in an effort to evict them and raise the rent with a new tenant, and they may not know they have the right to fight that lockout. So we're doing a lot of work in high-risk neighborhoods to spread information about tenant rights and to help make sure that they get connected to resources if and when a lockout were to occur. Okay. And so you already talked a little bit about data. I would just like to to go a bit deeper into that topic because it seems to me that talked about like low tech or even no tech in your outreach strategies, but actually in your, your backend, the way that you organize that outreach is very much data driven. So do you have any other examples of how you actually leverage data, use data to be it to adjust programs and to, to, to come to improvements of your programs uh, or, or of other departments, or also in your outreach strategies to actually design outreach strategies, um, tapping into the data? Yeah, I mean, we we think it's really important to be iterative. I think one of the critical pieces of successful outreach is not staying staying with one strategy, especially if it isn't working. So we do a lot of program assessment to figure out if our target population outreach is effective. Are we going out to doors? Are we reaching the people that we want to reach? If we're not, can we find new data sets and think differently about how we do that outreach? If we're, are we reaching people successfully by text message? If not, we may need to go out and hit them at the doors and, and stand on street corners. And being flexible and changing our campaigns based on what we're seeing in terms of our impact results is the way that we can eventually achieve success. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that flexibility, keeping that flexibility and being willing to learn and grow and think about creative tactics for how we can change is really important. And do you have an example, Adrian, of, because we talked a little bit about the, the success stories and what works for you and, and, you know, like going door, door to door, but what has been, um, on the flip side, what has been a lesson learned, something that was a failure, uh, a strategy you deployed, but that, you know, the data proved they were wrong and, and, and that, that, you know, like it wasn't most effective. Do you have mm. any surprising, um, lessons learned that you can share with us? Yeah. I mean, I think we can, we can talk a lot about, uh, some of the programs I mentioned earlier, the rent freeze program, we, um, for that and for our tenant work, we were doing a lot of tabling events. We would partner with elected offices, have our staff out in the community at a table. We do this also for our health initiatives. And, and you know, our, our theory is we want to be present in communities. We want people to see that we're there. We want them to know that government is accessible and having a face in their community, in their neighborhood is so important to making that accessibility visible. And yet we weren't necessarily seeing a lot of people coming up and getting the resources they needed. We weren't necessarily finding the people who we most wanted to find. So it doesn't mean that being out there at a table in the community isn't important. We still do it in many different programs, but we've been able to look at, are we reaching people in this way? And if not, now we need to pivot. And that means we need to pull back some of these events and focus more on targeted phone calls, on text messages, on canvassing, on one or, or all of the other opportunities to reach people that may be more focused on the data and less on the community visibility. Right. And is it fair to say that a maybe secondary objective, because you talked about, of course, like getting those programs used and those social benefits used, but isn't the secondary objective in a way also for you for, for the community to trust government and to, you just said, so like being out there, you know, like for them to be able to put a face to, you know, the, the big city of New York. Um, do you have, connecting those dots, do you have, talking about impact, talking about data, do you have any idea of, you know, the impact of, of your, your team's activities on, on levels of trust in government? Oh, it's such a great question. And I wish I had a better answer. I, <laughs> the answer is no, we don't know. I would love to find ways to, to capture it more. And it's something we've talked a lot around surveying, but truthfully, we're very content in knowing that we help individuals and then believe that there are ripple effects to that. 
we hear it anecdotally all the time. Somebody who speaks to one of our specialists and says, I never, you know, I've, I've t- I never would have expected this kind of customer service from government. They call back, they thank us, they write letters to the staff. Um, so many of our staff, because they build these relationships, years later are still picking up the phone and talking to their clients. I, I, a couple of weeks back, I was speaking to one of our team in their office and they picked up the phone and they said, oh, this guy, you know, we keep talking to him and and we've been talking to him every week. And we look in and realize that they're not talking to him because he has any issues anymore to resolve. They're talking to him because they're friends. <laughs> and, and we love that about the team. I think that that is also what really builds that trust and those relationships with the community. It's also, we have to be careful because we are a limited team and we need to make sure we use our time wisely, which is yeah. constant push and pull that we talk about. Mm-hmm. I mentioned earlier that we have a lot of resources in a city of this size, but actually I would say for a city of this size, we're still pretty small. We have um, over a hundred people, but this is a city of millions. So right. a smaller city may have less people, but they also have and less staff, but they also have less people to serve. So I think there are lessons to be learned from this outreach that no matter what the scale is of your team and the size, that you can really build powerful outreach programs. And then always we'll come back to that struggle of how much do we go in depth with with a particular client? How far can we go to serve them versus reaching more and more people at scale? And that is a a balance that we will always, a line we always have to walk. Mm Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And getting back to the topic of, of you mentioned already, um, you know, city of New York, huge bureaucracy, so many people working there. Um, how about bringing change from within? Um, so what are for you some of the challenges that you face, like um, to create a, an environment of, of innovation and change, um, you know, social impact? What are some of the main challenges you have been facing and what are what were some strategies to overcome these? The bureaucracy is challenging. Uh, I think everybody would agree. And there are reasons that institutions are designed to be slow. There, okay. Institutions are designed to be slow, to be careful, to make sure that we're using pa- taxpayer dollars effectively, um, that we're working with reliable and trustworthy vendors. Um, so many reasons that, that bureaucracy works in the way it does. And yet, when you want to be flexible agile, when you want to build new programs and new tools, it can be very, very challenging. We we like to think of ourselves at the forefront of the city and using technology. And when we had to come back from the field in the beginning of the pandemic, basically pull our staff away from face-to-face work, like door knocking, and move towards more uh, phone and online s- s- sources, we had to think differently about how we did our outreach. One of the things that we ended up doing was bringing Slack into our team. We were one of the first cities, to, I'm sorry, first agencies to do that. And it was really important because it kept our team on all the time, communicating with, with each other so we could be thoughtful about our outreach campaigns without being face-to-face in the office. It took us a very long time to get that tool. We had to be persistent. We had to write letters of justification because it goes through so many hoops before you can get something that... At a company, you may just snap your fingers and say, I want to use Slack because we're moving into the pandemic and this is a great remote tool. But here within the city, we have to be much more careful. And that means that if you really want something to get done, you have to be determined to make it happen. (laughs) Right, right. I found a fascinating quote. You said like institutions are, they're meant to be slow. Because it, there's clearly like two ends to this, right? There is, you talked about, you know, tools and being able to move quickly, respond quickly to the whole AI trends and, and generative AI and how this could help, you know, like uh, to boost productivity. I, I mean, I think it's really about being able to push the internal drive. Well, let me say this. I think that we all have this stereotype of a government bureaucrat who sits behind a desk, stamps things, asks only answers the questions that are directly asked of them, never provides additional information, is always trying to get out of of doing work. That is not my experience in government at all. My experience in government is that people come to government to be public servants. They believe in the work, they're passionate about the work, um, and they want to create change. But sometimes that slow pace of change can be demoralizing and it can lead them to want to stop trying. And we have to press ourselves as government servants, as public servants, to continue to be flexible and forward thinking and push for change. 
while we're working within an institution that is designed to make sure that no one person does something that hurts the general public, that uses money wastefully, um, that, you know, as we said, we are we're responsible for taxpayer dollars. And so the, every decision we make needs to be thoughtful. And if if we were to be able to snap our fingers and use a tool and that tool were, was a bad use of money, there would be public outrage. We need to make sure that we're careful about the decisions we made. And that's why the institutions are designed to be slow. But we can we can't let that drive the way that we think about change. And so that balance and that push and pull of the slowness of the institution and the passion and dedication of the public servants is what keeps us moving forward. The, yeah, crystal clear. And I like the way that you put it of like, you, we always have to keep in mind that we're dealing with taxpayers', taxpayers money, right? Um, that makes, makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. I also wish like linked to that. I, I wish that at least in Europe and know how to, how that's, or what your impression is in the United States, but that, um, attracting young people, talented people and offering, you know, like the public sector as a, as a, as a very promising and, 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 and high potential career track that is still missing today. I think in, in, in Europe, I have studied at the business school. Um, we never even talked about the public sector as an option to go into, you know, like this consulting firms, you could join a McKinsey or, or BCG or whatever. Um, but the public sector, we didn't even consider it. I absolutely agree. And I, I will say I'm very proud of this mayoral administration and for pushing the boundaries on things like remote work and coming out of the pandemic here in New York City. Everyone was asked to go back to the office. We know that if we salaries in, in city government are never going to be as high as McKinsey, we're never going to be able to attract people with with public in public sector with private sector money. What we can do is think differently about the way we work and make sure that we are being thoughtful about creating work life balance for people, creating flexibility for many of our, our team who are working and have families and, and need that support. So, you know, Mayor Adams and, and this administration has recently rolled out a remote work pilot. We are going to be allowing our staff to work at home for partial days when they're in the field, several days a week. It is going to be a completely different experience to work in government when they have that type of flexibility. That is not enough, but it's a real step in the right direction of being able to, to attract talent. Because I know so many people who immediately left the city when they had to go back to the office because they could find great jobs in nonprofits or in the public sector where they could work from home. Mm. And, you know, so those are the kinds of hard decisions and challenges that I think government needs to continue to work on mm -hmm. so that we can be competitive in the job market. I would add one thing to that is also presenting an opportunity to have a big impact on society, having a big social impact. And I think we're too shy and, and we're not loud enough about that in, in, in government and public sector. Um, which is actually a, a, a segue into your last topic I want to touch on is how do you, you're clearly doing pioneering work in the city of New York. Um, how do you make sure that some of those learnings, some of those, you know, like best practices that you have implement, implemented are also reaching other cities potentially? Have you thought of like ways that you could for yourself having a more systemic change and, and bring those learnings also to, um, to other governments? I wish we did more. We are always looking for more ways to learn and share with other cities. This podcast is a great example. And so thank you for having me on. I think that the more we can publicly talk about our work, not just with other cities in the US, but internationally, the more we can share best practices. And I'm very excited for those opportunities. We did recently have a, our tenant team had a conversation with the city of Philadelphia about the tenant helpline that we've built. I think the more we spread the word about our programs, we're able to connect with other cities who are looking to build similar programs or who've started and need guidance um, and also opportunities for us to learn from them. So more of these spaces are absolutely needed, more podcasts and more meetings more convenings, so that we can share best, best practices from one another because there are so many things, challenges and opportunities that we have in common. All right. As we wrap up this conversation, Adrian, I've got one last question for you. If there would be one single piece of advice you wish you had received before you embarked on this journey, what would it be? Yeah, well, um, I, I won't speak to the 23-year-old in the car in Nevada because exactly, that yeah. was probably a very different, I know that was a very different person, but maybe a little bit after that, when I started my, I moved to Washington, D.C. and was working in federal government and I was very frustrated about 
some of the things we've talked about, the, the bureaucracy, the lack of tangible results. I wish then that I, what I know now, which is that you have to breathe, <laughs> especially when you work in government, when you're early in your career, you feel like everything has to happen at once or you aren't making a difference. You have to see it or you aren't making a difference. And over time, I think I've gained the wisdom to have both the patience um, and determination to continue, but an understanding to see that the bigger picture means valuing the small wins each time toward to build towards bigger wins later down the line. And that culture change and government change is very, very challenging, particularly in a larger bureaucracy like New York City. But those changes are the most meaningful when you actually take the time to get to the other side of them. Awesome. Thanks so much for sharing. Thanks for this great conversation, Adrian. And I would say keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on our journey towards a democratic future. Subscribe to the podcast to stay connected. Next month, we'll be back with another trailblazer. And remember, democracy is a journey. It's not just a destination. Stay curious, engaged, and active in your local democracy. Until next time.